There are these two young fish swimming along, and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way, who nods at them and says, Morning, boys. How's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit, and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes, What the hell is water? This is a quote from the author David Foster Wallace. Welcome to Construction Genius. My name is Eric Anderton, and my guest today is Michael Girdley. Michael is an investor and entrepreneur. He has built, incubated, or sold seven businesses so far. And he's out of San Antonio, Texas, mainly in the tech space. But I'm having Michael on because he has deep insights into the role and importance of leadership. And the reason I read this David Waster, <laughs> David Foster Wallace quote at the beginning of the podcast is because many times as leaders, we get stuck in a box of our own perception and cannot see things from other people's point of view. And this hinders us as leaders. And in today's podcast, Michael and I take a a deep dive into why leaders misinterpret others or misperceive others, how that impacts their business, and what they can do to overcome that and become better leaders. It's a wide-ranging conversation. We dive into some insights in terms of leadership, the importance of peer groups, why leaders fail when they are hiring people, what they can do to make hiring an effective process, how to balance the need for empathy and sympathy, with a true definition of kindness and many other things besides. Uh, Michael is very generous with his insights. I think you'll find this conversation very useful. It's helpful to have someone on the show who is not directly involved in construction on a day-to-day -day basis because his insights will come from a non-construction perspective, but you're going to find that you can use and apply them in your construction business as a leader right away. Uh, there's links in the show notes to how you can get in touch with Michael. He has a big following on Twitter, by the way. That's how I met him. And uh, we do have a quick digression at the beginning of the podcast into how to build a Twitter following. Um, hang in for about 30 seconds to two minutes as I go into that digression because I did it for my own benefit. And then we'll dive into the main topic on leadership. Enjoy my conversation with Michael. Thank you for listening to Construction Genius. I deeply appreciate um, every one of you listening and sharing this podcast with others. And here we go. This is Eric Anderton, and you're listening to Construction Genius, a leadership masterclass. Thomas Edison said that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. If you're a construction leader, you know all about the perspiration, and this show is all about the 1% inspiration that you can add to your hard work to help you to improve your leadership. Michael, welcome to Construction Genius. Excited to be here. You and I met on Twitter, and Twitter is a hellhole in many ways, but it's also an awesome place to um, meet the right types of people if you curate your follows correctly. Is it, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's that's both the curse and the beauty of Twitter. So, you know, Twitter has a huge on-ramp. It's actually the biggest problem for new people to get into it is like, Look at the spam of all these people yelling. And next thing you know, like it's people talking about Kim Kardashian's figure and stuff. And you're like, what? How is this useful? Which creates a problem. But it's also the, the upside of that is it's so powerful that you have the ability to go in there and, and figure out who you can really learn from, who you want to hear from. You can mute the people that you know you you don't like and don't want to hear from, and you can block the ones that are annoying. Um, one's more aggressive, one's more passive aggressive. So you can yeah, right. do do either one that you want. But yeah, I mean, and that's that's the stickiness of it too. Once you get into Twitter and curate it in a way that's perfect for you, it just becomes incredibly valuable. I mean, it's the closest thing we have to a marketplace for ideas uh, well, well, on the let internet. Me, let me ask you a question then, um, just real quick. You you have a following on Twitter of fifty thousand people, from what I've seen. Uh, I right? think it's almost fifty nine, fifty eight thousand now. Fifty seven point eight. Yeah, and and that's go. an un and so you're not verified. You don't have one of those magical blue checks, and um, 
I know you spend a lot of time tweeting on Twitter, but I'm, I'm just interested from a from a marketing perspective. Why are you on Twitter, and and what what is it that you um, that you've done to build that following? Yeah, well, I'm I'm on Twitter from the philosophy that um, I have discovered that Twitter is a place where karma pays. Uh-huh. So every time I go on there and I feel like I'm giving. Um, the universe that is on the other side of tweeting pays me back 10, 20 times. Like just, right. it's, it just happens over and over again. So it looks at, at first glance, like it's giving, like it's, um, you know, it's me, me, you know, being very gracious and doing stuff, but it's actually total self-interest. Um, you know, and that's just, it's just the problem is it's delayed gratification, but yeah, that's what I do it. I mean, the connections, the learning, um, the number of times I read a tweet and it makes me think about something differently, like that's more powerful than, you know, all but the best hundred business books. Do you think that, um, Twitter is an appropriate platform for every company to be on in terms of marketing? No. Now, I mean, (laughs) I have a friend that they're actually in the construction management business. They have their, they have a couple, um, couple hundred, a couple, they've done a couple billion dollars worth of projects and, uh, they have a grand total of 35 followers and on Twitter and their people aren't here. I mean, that's just the reality of it. Um, you know, like, and, and that's not the only industry where that happens. Um, you know, private equity is another one where there's just, the, the people there just by and large above a certain scale don't share uh, on Twitter. So it really depends upon the um, both the, the market you're in, the business that you're in, then also how you're going to approach it, right? You have to get out of a lot of the old school ways that most of us have grown up. I'm 47. Um, I grew up in a world in which people are much more private. Um, but yeah. now like Twitter, like last week, I put my 10 year plan, like what I'm doing professionally and personally for the next, for the next 10 years, I posted the whole thing on there. I saw that, um, yeah. And if you're, if you're not comfortable with and, and, and safe and kind of who you are in life and all that kind of stuff, like it can be very scary, um, to do that stuff. And, and, you know, it's, it's tough to ask CEOs, um, the stuff that works on Twitter is when right. the CEO gets on there and tells their real truth, right. um, they don't want to hear, nobody wants to hear from your PR department. Right. Or your social media contractor. Um, so yeah, it's not right for everybody. Uh, it requires the right mindset and the right, you know, position in in, in the industry and state and life and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. So uh, just for the audience there, that was my own personal uh I did that for selfish reasons because I'm I'm on Twitter quite a bit, but um I haven't used it to promote my business. So I wanted to get Michael's take on that. And now we're we're gonna pivot now. <laughs> and we're we're going to go into um the reason why I have you on the show is because I think you have some very interesting perspectives on leadership. And I'd like to ask you, in, in your experience investing, building businesses, you know, you you've built your own business empire with seven businesses so far that you've bought or incubated. So you're you're on the ground in real life entrepreneurial situations all of the time. What what do most leaders get wrong about people? Yeah. I mean, I, I think I think we are all cursed with being the only uh, viewer and the director of the movie that we're watching through our eyes. Mm-hmm. And it, it took me decades to work out and develop natural empathy and natural sympathy for other people's situations and where they're coming from. Um, you know, and one of the stories I like to talk about uh, was when I was first a CEO, I used to think everybody else was motivated by money. Mm-hmm. I, I used to think that was the way to engage everybody because, you know, like I, I, first of all, I'm not really motivated by money, but I find it an, an intriguing way to keep score. And I yeah, like yeah. to keep score because I'm competitive. Yeah. Yep. So I thought everybody was wired the same way. And, you know, I used to go approach everybody that way. And I, and there's some good books around this topic, but it's just fundamentally this mindset that it is very difficult for most people to get out of that understanding of, hey, your perspective how you are wired, your background, how you think about things, that is unique to you compared to most people, right? Um, Just the same way, like I could never imagine having an accounting job. That sounds like the worst thing ever. There are people that are wired to do that. That is what they are put on earth to do. Um, And that's that's the biggest challenge. Like, how do you think outside the box when all you've ever seen is just the way your movie is, is running right inside your brain? 
Um, so tell me what you mean by sympathy and empathy. Those two words are often batted around in leadership. But what do you mean by that? Oh, I get them backwards. <laughs> None of one's fun. Yeah, right. But, but one of them is you can uh, put yourself in the other person's shoes. You're right. That's other, empathy. That's empathy. And the other one is uh, you feel emotion for yeah, yeah. that person's plight, right? So right. sympathy is uh, your, uh, your assistant's uh, father dies and you feel bad for him. Yeah. Or you feel bad for her and what she's him or her and what they're going through. Yeah. Uh, and then empathy is what must she be going through uh, or what must somebody else be going through in a different stage of life than where you are. Um, sympathy is probably easier for most people. Empathy is the harder one, right? Where you where you can put yourself in the other person's shoes and, and understand it. But um, yeah, I think I think most people that end up, especially leading companies, building businesses, like you're not wired that way. Typically, you're not a touchy feely person. You're a driven person yep. that has gone out and built a business. Um, so it requires you to flex in order to become that person and train yourself to do that. So what are the limits of sympathy and empathy? So l- let me frame it for you here. Um, I think one of the biggest weaknesses of a lot of the folks that I've worked with over the years is that they tend to hold on to people too long. Mm-hmm. They tend to get wrapped up in people's personal business and personal situation. And, you know, when they finally let someone go, I ask them, you know, how long ago should you have let them go? And it was, you know, six to 12 months. And many times the reason they didn't let them go was because of some sort of situation that involved a sympathetic or empathetic response from the leader. So how do you, how have you seen the best leaders um, manage their sympathy and empathy, assuming they at least have a little bit of it? Yeah, I mean it's it's incredibly hard. Um, I mean, th- the best leaders I know all get involved with peer groups, um, mm. and so um, there's I've been in a peer group for the past six years, so a CEO peer group. So there's Vistage, YPO, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I have found that that sort of forum overcomes the structural limitation that you have as a leader, right? As a, as a CEO founder of a business. Um, who's in their day-to-day fighting the battle, um, it's really often difficult to have empathy for yourself, right? To understand what's going on and to step outside of that. Um, and the number one habit I've seen leaders who've been able to balance that sympathy, empathy versus um, letting people go is being in a peer group. The highest, All the highest performers I know, they're all involved in that rather than trying to go it alone. Um, now, I would push back. I do think that most people use empathy and sympathy as an excuse not to get rid of poor performers right. um, just because a lot of times you keep poor performers around because you don't want your ego to be bruised that you made a mistake when you hire somebody. Okay, so, that's interesting. <laughs> but that's where a peer group comes in. They're like, well, wait a second. You know, you've come in three meetings in a row and you've told me that Jim is a problem. Yeah. Why haven't you done anything about this? Well, you know, he might turn around. Well, that's right. your ego talking. That's interesting because because you so you you attribute it to um, someone not letting someone go. You attribute it to the to the person's ego. I often attribute it personally to someone's um, unwillingness to have hard conversations. So tell me a little more about about why you would why you're attributing it more to the ego side of it. Uh, I'm saying it, it it can be that way because okay. we're all wired differently, right? Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, the people who are wired to be extroverted and connectors, which Typically, people who do podcasts are wired that way, like you're, sure. you're wired that way. Um, but then you see people that are uh, more mission-driven or more co- driven by competition or a sense of winning um, or by some people have a lens where they want to build a team, right? That's what that's what they do. Some of those people are the, the, the great team builders and systems builders that you see as COOs. Some of those are the worst people that hang on for people for too long. So I'm just saying that, uh, again, that is maybe your lens, but there's other lenses for why people are dysfunctional in terms of keeping people around. Interesting. Okay. So, (laughs) so we're talking about this idea of, of our different lenses. Yeah. And, um, and that is why leaders misperceive others. Um, What are the areas of misperception that are most damaging for a leader as they're involved with the people who report to them as they're thinking and, and building their business? Yeah. I mean, I think there's two common themes there. One is 
you know, you apply the way you look at the world to other people. Um, and, and so that's, that's a damaging thing. So you assume that they're going to look at things the way you did. I talked about that money driven stuff. So that yeah. that's, that's a usually damaging lens. The second thing is that you don't do a good enough job gathering enough data. Right. And, right. and why wouldn't you gather enough data as a leader? Well, typically because you don't shut up enough. Right. <laughs> you need to listen. Most leaders don't listen enough. So, Okay, so let's let's talk about listening. In your experience, what are some simple but powerful ways to become a better listener? Yeah, yeah. So I I don't know if I'm a great listener. Um, one of the things I do each year is I have my business coach go interview everybody I work closest with, so I can get data because I'm a data driven person, um, and have him tell me what I do better. I have heard that I've become a better listener. And I really have found that the way to do that is by having better habits and like habits are like when I'm sitting down in a one-on-one, like with a teammate, like uh, my goal is to talk no more than 20% of the time, like, and, and just distill it down to these very basic rules to where, you know, I mean, you've heard me talk for the past five minutes. Like I can, I can eloquently lecture on whatever you want. Um, But, but my job as a leader is to shut up. And so I have to break those habits and, and I'm a very habit driven builder of, of trying to do the right behavior. So that, that's what I do. I think that's how to keep it really simple. Like simple stuff is what works. Like just say, okay, well, um, I am going to make sure everybody in this, in every meeting I go to talks before I do. Okay. Excellent. Yeah, Excellent. Just- now, when you say a leader struggles with getting out of their own uh, head, so to speak, to be able to see something from a different point of view. Um, when it comes to building a company, how important is it to have people who perceive the world in the same way that you do from a, let's say, a values perspective as opposed to a... Um, Traits. Yes. Thank you. A yeah. traits perspective. Yeah. So yeah. I think that that describes the dichotomy of what you want in a great high-performing team. You want consistent values and approaches and, and dreams amongst people, right? Um, so if if you're a nine to fiver, you don't wanna go sign up for a, an 80 hour a week, you know, crunch time kind of job, right? right. Um, so values need to be consistent and that's where cultural interviews and just your gut tell you a lot mm-hmm. um, through that process. Do I wanna work with this person? Your gut tells you if you need to and, and if you want to. The, the second part of it is you, you actually, end up with the most powerful teams by having people that are wired entirely differently. You have somebody like me who is wired to be incredibly um, creative. Do you want me in your accounting department? You do not. Do you want that person who loves to follow rules and calls people out? Do you want them in your accounting department? Absolutely. Those are traits um, that can be measured. Those are traits that you want to work to and you want to build your team. So you have heterogeneous traits, but homogeneous values and culture. Okay, so, so that's a good framework there. Heterogeneous traits, homogeneous um, values and culture. Mm-hmm. Okay, so then um, one of the things that that you've, I, one of the tweets that I like um, that you've, you've put out here is, it says here, most people asking for advice really don't want to have their mind changed. Yeah. Why, why do you think that is? <laughs> um, you know, it, it's, it's unfortunately, and, and I've come a lot from the startup world and the business world, yep. people have given some bad advice to other people that the way you go get money or the way you go get results or promotions or develop relationships is by asking, asking for what you don't want. You know, it's like, oh, well, get, get advice and get that wealthy person to speak to you the way they're supposed to, as opposed to walking in there and just being very upfront about what's going on. So, you know, there's been this, just this cultural problem inside of the American business community where we have told these young people, like, if you want advice, uh, ask for money. If you want money, ask for advice. And it's just like the biggest bunch of horse crap. Um, so I think it's a disservice to anybody under 40, unfortunately, but um, I think that's the way it is. And then I think secondarily, the problem there is I've learned a long time ago, just to, to, trying to change people's minds is really not that much fun. <laughs> most right. people, most people really don't want their mind changed. That's why the number of people who, who watch Fox News and MSNBC at the same time, it's, they're few and far between. 
Right, right. So that's interesting, though. But so then, how does that affect people when they're looking to build a business or build a team? When when we we are so stuck in our ways and we're so reluctant for um, either to, to discover ourselves or for other people to say, "Hey, dude, what you're doing is completely wrong, and you need to have a different perspective." Yeah. Well, I think that that ties into one of the biggest challenges in American culture, right? Like we're so all afraid right now of offending each other that it's actually incredibly difficult to get constructive criticism. Like, you know, maybe that's different in New York and stuff, but I'm in Texas and like, everybody is so sweet. Like they won't even, like if people, if you're, if you ever hear this, Hey, let's go get lunch sometime. Uh, and it drove my wife crazy when we first moved here from the West coast, because people would be like, let's go get lunch sometime. And she follow up with them and they would <laughs> never respond. It's because <laughs> the people like, you know, like they don't, it, they just say that because nobody's actually very direct in the South. Um, and I think it's a, it's a big problem. Like we, we talk, talked when I left the West Coast, um, we talked about the the California no. And it, the California no is people just kind of float off. They like never, they never actually tell you no. So it kind of ties back to all of this is this cultural problem where unlike Israel, for example, right, where the, the most buck private is going to tell the general, hey, you're an idiot. Right. Um, and there's a downside of that. But that's the culture there, like super hyper directiveness because they, they want to have that. You know, you're in a world here where you have to fight to get feedback and data points because people are just so fair. And it's only getting worse, right, because everybody's afraid of getting canceled by telling each other the wrong stuff. So, you know, that's where as a leader, I strongly believe you have to put together systems where you get feedback, right? And it can be the systematic employee pulses. It can be written 360 reviews. Uh, it's what I do with my business coach where he goes and interviews people. So I hear the stuff that that I, I just don't know I'm doing wrong. Like so all Let me, that, let all me that explore stuff this with you then, because I think this is, a, I do think this is a massive issue is that is and and this can hinder the growth of a company it hinders people from telling the truth to each other and so therefore you've got these issues in a company that just perpetuate and and uh and and just keep going and going and going so what have you found to be the most effective feedback mechanism for a leader like go into some detail on on one of your favorites yeah uh, it's great question asking right like and it's it's sitting down when you're when you have a trustworthy a trusting relationship with anybody in the team, um, being there, being present with them, and asking them, what do you think? What should we do differently? What would what you are recommend? what are some of the questions that a leader now, now? I think there's a lot of value in asking, you know, getting anonymous feedback or um, not anonymous feedback. There's a whole bunch of different takes on that. But yeah. what are some of the specific questions a leader in a business should should be? Um, getting answered in one form or another so that they can identify the problems either with themselves or with the business that need to be addressed. Yeah. Well, I think the secret there, um, and I've learned this in in pitch meetings and stuff, so I'll be pitching people or they're sure. pitching me. I have learned to ask the feedback question in a way that is not uh, threatening to the other person. Okay. Right. And so typically you'll go and you'll say, what should, what should we do differently? What do you right. think is wrong? Okay. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. what's the, what's the problem with asking the question that way? That but, person has yeah. to stand up for that view. Yeah. Right. But you have a different way of asking it is um, what would you do differently if you were me? Yep. Right. Think about, think about the subtle nuance that's different there in terms of the social status of me as the CEO, asking somebody two levels down over a social lunch. What, what would you do differently with your mate? That's different. That is not me putting you in the place where you're forced to give me advice. That is me thinking about in the context of this, how do I get you to ask something that's not going to be uh, deconstructive, right? Or you're going to feel career threatened when I ask you that. So, so it's it, a lot of it has to do then with the way that you structure the questions. Um, I think there's one of the problems is, is, you know, that power dynamic between the leaders and those who are being led and getting in these situations where the leader genuinely wants feedback and is not looking to retaliate, but either his, his or her people are afraid, or even if the leader wants feedback, they somehow come across in a way that they don't want feedback. Um, so how does, how does a leader lay the groundwork for that feedback process so that people are as comfortable as possible? Yeah. Well, I think it's, um, the people that I see do it really well are the ones that respond appropriately and consistently do that, right? And so appropriately is 
Um, I don't know if, if you've ever been in EO, that's one of the peer groups um, sure. or in Vistage. I'm in Vistage now. Yeah. But one of the things you do when you process an issue in your Vistage group is they give you feedback and you only get to say one thing. Yeah, right. Thank you. <laughs> that's what you get to say. Thank you. <laughs> and you know, it's that mindset of gratitude that if you if you have that habit when you're listening is to say thank you because that person just went out on a limb to do that. And, you know, culture, I'm a big believer that culture stems from the leadership um, Uh and then that promulgates down. And if you as a a C-level leader are doing that, I think you have a really powerful opportunity to push that down into your organization and then hire and fire around it. Um, So anyway, I I do feel like you're asking these very complex questions. And my strategy with all this stuff is, oh, I just shut up more or (laughs) I just just try to simplify everything. And I'm just like, oh, I need to shut up more, you know, and I'm going to listen. So, so I think that's that is a tremendous thing, um, and 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 like you said earlier, one of the hardest things for us to do as leaders is to shut up. Um, and I I think the quality of your questions then gives you an opportunity to shut up because that'll hopefully lead to a quality answer. Um, I myself, I one thing I do which I found effective over the years is I will actually physically, when I'm in a conversation with someone where I have to listen more, I I bunch up the toes on my right foot. Mm -hmm. And I say to myself, ground yourself. And I I picked that up from a mentor of mine, Bill Cole, many years ago. And and what that does is it brings me into the moment of the conversation and stops my own racing mind so that I can actually listen to that person. Yeah. I love that. That's a great habit. Super cool habit. Yeah. No, it's it's a a really good one. Um, I think, and I think, well, let me ask you this. What do you do when someone shares with you a piece of feedback where you have an emotional response to it and you're on the verge of justifying yourself or correcting them or something like that? How do you handle that? Yeah, that's really hard, right? It's, <laughs> I, mean, it's, I, I would say it's really hard, but I've seen it for other people. I think it's relatively easy for me. Like I'm a dispassionate person. Okay. I lose my temper once every 18 months and it's getting more infrequent the older I get, uh-huh. <laughs> the more the hormones go away. Yeah, yeah, um, right. But you know, that's where that's where I'm I'm a huge fan of the ideas that you've seen come out of a lot of Eastern philosophies and Buddhism mm-hmm. and Zen Buddhism, stuff like that, like thought control, mental control, emotional control, tying that back to your breath. You know, those are just habits that you get into. Um, And some of that gets wired when you're young. You know, I see my kids doing it now. They've seen us model and there is no emotional explosion in our house. My wife and I are very dispassionate people. We've never had a knockdown drag out. It's just like, that's who we are. Um, And some of that gets wired in, but some of it is also things you start to learn, right? You start to learn, oh, you know, this is how I need to control how I'm thinking about this, right? Or this is an opportunity where I'm feeling that overwhelming sense of anger, right? And I'm going to lose my temper and I'm going to take three deep breaths and then think about how I'm going to feel about it. That's that extra step that that's trainable, that's learnable. Um, It requires self-control. It's hard, but yeah, I mean, that's what I have to do. Like if somebody insults me, it's like deep breath. This is about business. Put my ego aside. What matters is we win. Keep going. So interesting. Uh, You know, you bring up the, uh, your, your family life Our you know, I know in, in our family life, you know, I got I got five kids. My wife and I have been married almost twenty years, and you know we're we're emotional people at our family. So you know, there's the volume can rise at times, and it's hilarious because my kids they'll look at me sometimes and they'll see me take this massive deep breath, you know, mm-hmm. to 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 get control of myself so that I, it doesn't become an explosion and an escalation. And they're always they and they start laughing at me because they're like, Ah, Papa, look at you take that massive deep breath. <laughs> Uh, you know, we think about parenting a lot as being the things you say to your kids. And what you're demonstrating there is a gift that's of unimaginable value for them, right? They are learning through your modeling of that self-control that you've invested in. Like, that's enormous. Like you should, they should say thank you. <laughs> they won't yeah, ever because right. they're kids, but <laughs> like that, that is such a huge gift in life because they're going to be 40 someday and Somebody's going to do something to them and they're going to make the right choice because they've seen you model that behavior over and over again. That's that's really admirable. 
Yeah, that's interesting. It, it's interesting. That's that's a good thing about um, parenting, not to go out too much of a rabbit hole, is that it's kind of like baseball where you get lots of at bats, right? So you you might strike out one day, but the, uh, you know you get another at bat the next day, and hopefully you can hit a single. You know? Oh, for sure. <laughs> well, and then you know, counter to the kind of parenting industrial complex that we all get subjected to. Yeah. You know, I think after a few kids, which you've had it, you start to say, oh, like. I really have less influence on this child's outcome than I really, you know, they mm-hmm. really told me before the thing came out. And that that's just reassuring and relaxing. It's made me a better dad. Just be like, eh, I'm going to screw up some stuff. <laughs> that's just <laughs> the way it's going to be. Uh, but I'll do my best, love my kids. And and I'm sure they'll turn out fine. So let's, let's, let's explore that a little bit. This, this idea of failure then, um, and take it into the business realm. Um, you know, one of, one of the, uh, one of the uh, quotes I like, and I believe it's from Churchill, is being able to go from failure to failure without a loss of enthusiasm. Um, how do entrepreneurs continue to move forward despite the failures and the challenges that they're they're faced with? How do you? How what have you seen from entrepreneurs that are some best practices as far as that's concerned? Yeah, I, I think that's all. Uh, like many things, comes down to mindset, right? Like you, if you understand going into things that you are running experiments when you try stuff, you know, you try something new on a construction site or something new in a software company or any of that kind of stuff, and it doesn't work out. Um, you know, that was a learning opportunity, and that was part of the journey. And I think we've all seen that. You've seen that squiggle. Uh, there's like a there's like a graph where it's like what people think. You know, entrepreneurship is is like this straight up to the right line, and it's yeah, actually right. this like jagged thing. And if you have the right mindset where you understand that the trying of new things, the calculated bets, right? Hiring hiring a person that you think has a 70% chance of being an A player and a 30% chance of being terrible. If, if you have that mindset that this is a probabilistic learning exercise that nobody really knows what they're doing, yep. um, that mindset can make all that very easy. Um, you know, I do think the, I, I have seen actually the opposite problem with entrepreneurs. Okay. Like Tell I me. see people I see people that are grinding away at stuff or trying to innovate around things. And I'm like, I don't think this is getting any better. Like year year six, maybe you should think about a different line of work or try something different. And I admire those people because like after 18 months or so, I feel like the universe is telling me something and I go try something else. Um, So it it is an interesting interesting pattern uh, that a lot of times these hard-headed people that are so wired to go after these opportunities, you know, they get stuck and doesn't go anywhere and then they don't quit. Um, I, I'm a big fan of quitting. Okay, great. So when, when do you quit? I think it ties back to what you talked about. You know, when you, when you have that emotional response that you're not excited to wake up the next day to keep working on the thing and everybody gets down Fridays, you're tired and stuff like that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you sit down, go for a long walk and you say, what am I put on earth to do? Right. What, what will self-actualize me at the point that you feel like, this is not self-actualizing for you anymore, that the universe is screaming at you that this isn't going to work, that this isn't the right thing for you. Um, That's when it's time to make a change. And it's the same with firing people. It's kind of like, it's time to split. The moment you think it's not going to work, that's when it's not working. (laughs) It's time to to make that change. We talked about keeping people around for too long. Um, I have a lot of strong opinions about that too. Oh, tell me about that. Come on, let's let's talk about that. What, What strong opinions do you hold there? Uh, you know, I think that, uh, I think that most people, we talked about that ego thing of not wanting to let go of people. And then you talked about the sympathy, empathy thing. Like you feel bad, like, Oh, what am I going to do to Joe? Like, um, you know, I think the way our economy has graduated now, you are actually doing people a disservice by letting them be in roles where they cannot thrive. Right. And I see my job in life to help people get into roles where they can thrive and be their best selves. And that journey that they want to be on is accelerated. And I think you're actually, the longer you let somebody thrash and do poorly in a role, you're actually doing them an unkindness. Um, And I think if you have that mindset, it makes it much easier to split up with people. And in a way, in a way, you can also split up with them in a way that becomes entirely supportive. Like, hey, there is a right journey for you. This is not the correct stop. How do I help you get into it? Because I care about you as a person more than I care about the mission, but I have to balance the two. Okay. Um, so let's talk about this idea of, of someone finding what they're really good at and then pursuing it. Um, and the idea of quitting and, and 
And what I began to think think about there is that many times um, companies struggle to hire in new talent, particularly young people, because it seems that they they're just bouncing around from one career to another or one job to another. In in your experience, what what have successful company builders and entrepreneurs, what do they focus on in order to attract and then develop young talent? Yeah. Um, You know, I think this changes all the time. You know, I think, I think when it, in my parents' generation, the boomers, it was all about, you know, lifetime employment or letting your freak flag fly or whatever. Gen X, I don't know what's important to us. We're just a bunch of weird, we're the weirdo generation that nobody cares about this. Um, You know, but I think, I think we've ended up in a place that I think is extremely powerful, but it's hard for older entrepreneurs to wrap their head around, which is when you start to see each person as a holistic person, that's part of your team. And you start to see yourself as part of their journey, as opposed to vice versa, as opposed to a cog in your machine. That's when having, you know, I think the ability to recruit just, just explodes, right? Because people know that they don't have to be afraid, right? They know that your boss, that the company culture understands that you may do a tour of duty with us for two years. And then we're going to throw you a party when you get there. And we're going to throw you a party when you leave, because we're going to see you as a person and not just as a tool that we're going to use and throw away. Um, And all of that is cultural things that you have to do as a CEO, founder, owner, um, spread that and, and model that for your team to do that. Um, And, you know, I think it's that mindset shift that I've seen the great leaders. um, And one of the ones I work with has had two regrettable attritions out of 300 or so people uh, in the past couple of years. And that's what he does. That's exactly what he does. He sees them as people and he sees them as part of the team and helps them on their journey. And if they leave, they leave, you know, and he's going to support them um, because that's how we make sure the next great person comes to the door. What do you say to those leaders who who are reluctant to invest in their people and to spend too much time with them because of their fear that um, you know my industry is so competitive that the the next guy is just going to come around and throw a few extra bucks at them they're going to leave and then all my yeah. time will be wasted. I, I think it's a real um, it's a real unfortunate byproduct of the way our system is set up. I mean you. You have to, you know, you, the days of, you know, NCR putting you through a training program for two years right. and growing your skills, which a lot of our college programs assume that's going to happen, right? College does, college just says we're not in the job, the, yeah. the job, job readiness market. Um, you know, I think that's a totally logical, rational approach to say, yeah, if I up, per, up this person's skills that I'm going to lose them. Um, you know, I think, I think that's where you have to have the mindset that, you know, if you come back to this journey thing, you know, the shark that doesn't swim dies, right. You have to, you have to let them keep growing, help keep developing. And that is a retention strategy. Yes. It's going to eventually cost you more, um, when you have to pay that person market, but maybe you should be paying them market, you know, that's just part of the deal. So that's, that's generally my response to that is, yeah, grow, grow the people. It's a retention mechanism, but yeah, when you grow them to be something better, then you're probably gonna have to pay for that too. Excellent. Um, in one of another one of your tweets, you 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 made a long list of um, 16 biggest life uh, mistakes that you've made, and one of them is hiring without a process. So um, let me ask you about hiring here. Um, when you're hiring folks, assessments overrated, underrated, properly rated, using of assessments. What do you think? What is the general consensus on assessments? I mean, I went from totally anti-assessment to like live and die by them at this point. Yeah, so. well, well, it's a, I think there's a there's a variety. I I find with the folks that I work with, some people don't use assessments at all. Some people, like you say, live and die by them. Some people use them as, let's say, a third of of the process. Um, I, give us a little bit on how you've evolved over the years, as far as that's concerned. Yeah. I mean, I, I think early on hiring in my career, um, I first started with the classical like brain teaser and asking people questions and, you know, get people to tell you what they're going to do type stuff. And then that didn't work very well. Um, so then I eventually went with the random lottery approach, which was just like, okay, I'd interview for 10 minutes. And if I have a good gut feeling about you, I would hire you. And yep. that sucked. Um and then, you know, and, and then I eventually, uh, it, as part of my CEO group, just got tired of making bad hires. And a, a business partner in front of mine said, hey, you got to go look at this thing called top grading. Uh, another friend said, you got to go look at this, this personality assessment called culture index. Uh, another one said, you got to go look at this um, cognitive assessment. And what I started to piece together was 
um, the framework of, I think, a pretty robust approach to hiring. So um, how do I kind of measure the three things that are super important with, with somebody's coming in, right? You have number one, like how smart is somebody and what is their ability to learn? That's what the cognitive assessments do. Um, how is somebody wired? We talked before about the way you want somebody to be in accounting is different than you want them to be in, in graphic design. Like, so how do we measure those traits? And then the third thing we talked about are kind of these cultural values and track record. Um, so I have systems to really measure each of those things and, and create a funnel of candidates and hopefully spit out some good ones at the bottom. Does the, um, the smartness aspect of it, does that vary from position to position? Yeah, totally. I mean, you don't need somebody with 140 IQ to, drive a truck. But um, I mean, for the, um, I mean, you might be, I mean, maybe 140 IQ makes you go really, really fast. I have no idea <laughs> if I, if I get there, we'll see what happens. But um, yeah, for me, you know, in the work I'm doing, I'm typically hiring business leaders, GMs, COOs of stuff, um, very high level folks. So um, the higher you get, you know, towards, towards that super end of executive and creativity and knowledge work and creation of stuff, um, the more being higher horsepower cognitively really affects things. How quickly can you internalize information, process it, and then act upon it? Um, that's really valuable for me. I've, I've found personally um, for the people I'm hiring for that work for me directly um, or that I partner with on businesses, the intelligent ones I have more fun working with. So. Yeah, yeah, no, that's 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 very true. Um, what is the number one reason a um, qualified CEO who's brought into a company fails? And when I say qualified, I mean in all three of those areas. They're smart. They're wired right. They're culturally um, on the in the right way, but they but they fail. Why is that? Yeah. So I actually, uh, if you buy into the theory of people being wired differently in terms of traits, there are different traits that you want at different times for a company. Uh, and I think, yeah. I think you often see mismatches of that. So for example, when would you hire me as a CEO? I know how I'm wired, right? I am good in a crisis. I'm great with create, creatively coming in and triaging something. I am terrible at making the trains run on time. And if you think about kind of the wartime versus peacetime metaphor yeah, yeah, yeah. for companies, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm a great wartime CEO. Peacetime, yep. uh, we'll do anything once great. And the second time I'll be bored and I just yep. won't do a great job at it. And then the third time I'll forget to do it. Um, so, you know, you have to really have the right fit of that, that person for the stage of the company. There is also the other thing where, um, you know, you go through the evolution of a company and the person you are as a CEO really changes four or five, six times. Uh, as you go through the growth of a company, um, the person you want when it's just a one person with a PowerPoint is totally different than the person you want when it's two layers of management and totally different when you have six layers of management below you, which is why guys like Zuckerberg or Mark Benioff and those type of guys who've built 50,000 person organizations from one, like, like that's amazing. Like, I yeah. can't believe somebody is that's more more people than Spider Man has turned into. Like yep. <laughs> best, yeah, right. best Amy. So, you know, I think to to bring all that back in a TLDR for your answer, it's you know, the wrong person for the the right time at a company in terms of the state of the company. Yeah. Um, a distressed company needs somebody totally different than a grinded out kind of person. And then the second thing is the company will also evolve past where a CEO is, right? Yeah, yeah. Once once a C, once a CRM gets put into a company, like I'm a terrible person to run the company. Like that's huh. the realization I had 15 years ago. I was like, yeah. oh, I suck at this. I need to find somebody who's actually wired to do this the right way. So those are the, those are the things I see. Okay, so let's say I'm I'm the CEO of a company. I'm listening to the podcast right now, and I have a sneaky suspicion based on what you just said that I am um, the right person at the wrong time of the company. The company has either grown past me, or it's perhaps because I, I know a lot of the dudes I work with, man, they're like they're 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 a little bit cowboy. They know that yeah. they are. They cowboyed their company up. They've kicked some ass over a number of years. And if they really want to be able to put the company at a place where they can sell it, for instance, and cash out at the end of their hard work, they, something needs to change. Something needs to happen that they maybe don't have the capacity for. What yep. advice do you have for those people? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's where you you start first with the vision that you have. What what do you actually want out of all this? Do you want to sell your business? Do you want a cousin to run it? Do you want to give it to your kids? Do you yep. want to become a passive owner? Um, you know, you start with that vision of what you want your life to be like, and it's not just professionally; it's also personally. Like, do you yep. want to do you want a fishing boat? Like, uh, personally, I hate fishing, but whatever. Um, yep. If that's what's what you're into, go for it. So you start with that vision, and then you work your way back to where it is today. Um, you know, and that's where you have to evolve yourself to get to all those visions. I mean, let's just be realistic about it. You can be that person that's going to die at your desk in your early eighties. I know people that are doing that more yep. power to them. Yep. Um, or you can be a person that evolves um, to have the life that you want. And that's building the right systems, hiring the right people, changing your expectations. And then all that stuff is actually the easy stuff. In my opinion, the hard part of making that transition to the life you want is actually changing yourself in terms of how you're going to do stuff. And like a great example of that is I can go into almost any meeting with a company and I can bludgeon everybody into agreeing with me, right? Because I, I own the thing or or I have more experience or I'm just eloquent and I can do that and I can argue. Um, but I can't do that. I shouldn't do that because I have to change me in order to match the role of say supporting who the leader is going to be, right? I have to be there. Um, and that's the hard part for all these folks. And I'm glad I tried to do it in my thirties and forties. Cause I couldn't imagine being 65 and trying to change that. Like, the neuroplasticity has ceased at that point. So yeah, it's a huge challenge, but yeah, I think you, you do your vision and then you work your way back to where you want to be today. And then you got to ask yourself, can I do that? Can I be that person that this business needs me to be, needs me to be? And maybe you can't, or maybe you can, but. It's interesting because it, it, it requires such a tremendous amount of um, healthy ego blended with this self um, self knowledge and humility in order to 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 build a business like you're describing right now, mm -hmm. and and I think based on what you're saying, um, so many folks they start this this idea of succession planning and you know what are we going to do with the business beyond me? And you mentioned you know it, this is hard to do when you get into your your 60s. I would say it's even hard to do when you get into your 50s because <laughs> you know we are so stuck in our ways. You know what I mean? And so yeah. that really is an argument for doing some hard thinking around this when you first start the business in your 30s or maybe your 40s. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with that. You know, it's I feel I feel lucky that maybe I'm doing okay at it. <laughs> so it's going well. Well, at least you're aware of it and you're working on it and that's the thing is that so many people they're they're it's like those things in the back of their heads are saying I know I got to work on this. I know I got to work on this, but here's my next deal, here's my next project, here's my next gig and then, you know, 15 years later they still haven't worked on it. Yeah. It is funny. I um I do think this ties back to what we were talking about about how do you get reality, right? How do you get outside that movie that's yep. going on in your brain and how do you get the data and how do you become that listener? And you know, I had a a buddy reach out to me and he's like, "Hey, I want some advice. What should I do with XYZ business?" And I said, oh, okay, you want some advice? I'll tell you. And I told him, I was like, oh, you're not a very good operator and uh, you should hire somebody to do operations for you because you aren't very good at it. And uh, he told me he was really good at operations. I was like, oh, okay, well, whatever you want. <laughs> it's totally fine. But like, there's so many kind of things you have to do to get, to get out of your own head and have that perspective of understanding who are my employees? What do they want? What are they thinking? You know, what do I really want? What am I good at? What am I bad at? And and be open to, you know, that reality. And it's it's hard. It's hard, hard, hard stuff to do, especially if you're the hard-headed person who decided to start a business. Because you're by you're, you're by nature delusional enough to think that you could live a better life doing that than just getting a cushy job someplace. <laughs> yes, delusions. Yes, yes, yes. Love those. Okay, so um, let's say I'm 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 a leader now. I've been listening for the past forty minutes or so. I know I need to improve. Where should I start? Yeah, I'm, I'm a huge, huge advocate. I think everybody should uh, join a peer group. Like, I think that's the, the first place to go. Um, okay. You know, and, and that's, not, that's not you hanging out in the sauna at the country club. That's going to a serious YPO, Vistage, EO, Tab, one of those joining and going in with an open mindset that no matter how old you are, you have growing that you can do. Um, 
by getting data, getting feedback, getting connections with other people, talking through your problems and, and going through what's there. That, that's the first thing I would sign up for. It's just, how do you, how do you get into one of those? Excellent. And, and you would say a peer group as opposed to an individual coach or individual mentor? You know, I, I think the individual coaches are good. The best actual peer groups come with coaching. Like my Vistage comes with a monthly coach session. Yep. Um, we pay for it. Um, you know, I was pretty intentional when I signed up for a peer group. I said, okay, well, like I'm wired hardcore and I want to achieve great things. So which is the most hardcore group I can go to in San Antonio? And I went and joined the most expensive, most hardcore group um, I could join. And yeah, that's that's that. Some of the other groups, some of the other peer groups are all about the parties. I, right. That's not, that's not for me. Yeah, right, that's not right, for right. me. Okay. So join a peer group. What's, what's another thing I can do right away? Yeah. I would take a look at, um, I have on my website, gridley.com. I'm not yep. selling it. I have a, a list of systems that I've adopted across all my businesses. Um, okay. I give those out for free. They're, they're actually books that you can buy on Amazon for 12 bucks. I don't make any money about it. Um, besides a peer group, that's the second set of kind of transformative things um, that I have done as a CEO that, you know, I call it the playbook. It's the, the eight of the systems that I went and looked at hundreds of them. And I picked those, um, they, how do you hire, right? How do you build culture, right? How do you do strategic planning, right? How do you measure customer satisfaction, right? Um, I went and did the work to go look at all those systems. And, you know, I would say, go pick and choose those. The first one you should do when you're doing a business is go do EOS the entrepreneurial uh-huh. operating system. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, there's other ones, but that's the one that's simplified. I like the most, but, you know, start with the peer group, go look at the playbook, do EOS. Um, and then the next one after there is bring in a personality assessment. Okay. And so that's, uh, that's, we're going to put a link in the show notes. It's girdly.com slash playbook. Is that the, is that the link? That sounds right. Yeah. Systems of system of systems for business and startup management for companies with less than 250 employees. Yep. I think that's it. Yeah, 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 yeah. We got it right here. Cool. I'm going to put that in the show notes. That's excellent. Excellent. Okay. Well, I tell you, I've really, really enjoyed this conversation here. Um, I do like to la- ask each one of my guests. Now, you're from California, right? What part of California? What? I'm from Texas. No, no, no. But you you, you came from California. <laughs> oh, no. I'm from Texas. I grew up right over there. <laughs> okay. Uh, so San nope. Antonio, but but I, I, thought you, I thought you just said earlier in the interview that you came from California. Oh, yes. Great. Okay. That's totally, totally my bad. Um, no, I went, I grew up in San Antonio my whole uh-huh. life here. Uh, when I was 18, I went to college in Pennsylvania and then uh-huh. I moved to San Francisco and my wife and I lived there for, met there and lived there until 2004, 2005. Right. And then we moved back to San Antonio and we've been here for the past 17 years. Okay, cool. So, so first thing, what's, what's the biggest difference between California and Texas? Uh, I'm in California, by the way. That's why I'm asking. Oh, I mean, uh, the, um, Really, who controls the state house? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, your state, the best I can tell, is being run by the unions, and our state appears to be run by the oil men. So those okay. are the uh, that's that's the biggest dichotomy. So pick your poison. Uh, yeah, I mean, as a business person, Texas is a much better place to do business. Yeah. Um, than than California is right now, it seems. So San Antonio, um, I've never visited. I have friends who live in the area. They tell me it's awesome. What is the one place that you're going to take someone to to uh, to eat when they come and visit you there? Uh, eat? I don't know. What kind of food do you like? Do you like Tex-Mex? You have ever had Tex-Mex? I'm flexible, man. I'll eat anything. <laughs> I mean, I think if you come to San Antonio, we we pretty much have a cuisine that is unique to this corner of America, which is Tex-Mex. And it is the least healthy cuisine in the history of dinner, of dinner. Um, and there is just, you know, until you go to, you know, our, our, our city, unfortunately is very racially segregated. Um, until you go to a South side, uh, Taker, Taqueria, Tex-Mex place, usually with a number in the name, you know, like, yeah, right. you know, Las Palapas number nine, uh, and get a, a Tex-Mex plate, you know, with an enchilada tamale and a, uh, and a puffy taco, rice and beans, you know, that's, that's definitely somebody from out of town should do that. And then, you know, definitely plan a slow day the next day. So I, I would take you there. Los Barrios is a good place. Uh, it's run by the Barrios family here in San Antonio. Um, and they're just right around the corner. So that, that would be Great. a fun one for Tex-Mex. And then, uh, there's a lot of other good food here. We have a, the, uh, Culinary Institute of America, CIA. There's only three of them in the U S um, one's in, uh, New York, the other one's up in Napa Valley and the third one's here. Uh, and we've just had an explosion of 
like great culinary options since that came here. So there's, there's six months worth of great restaurants I could take you to. Great. I just pulled up the Los Barrios website and that does look, um, it looks tempting, but it looks costly. <laughs> uh, the food's cheap. Right. But the, costly in terms of the impact the, upon you. <laughs> the uh, six months you need to spend at the gym to work that off is, is pretty intense, but it's a great way to get a 2,500 calorie meal. <laughs> right on. Right on. <laughs> so uh, Michael, just as we're wrapping up here, appreciate the generosity you've shown us here. What, what's the best way for folks to get in touch with you if they'd like to? Yeah. Um, I'm on Twitter like crazy. So at Girdley, my last name, uh, you can usually DM me there um, or contact information's on my website, girdley.com. Um, I don't have anything to sell. Um, just out here trying to get back to the universe and make the world a better place than I found it. Beautiful. We will put those um, links in the show notes and um, I appreciate your generosity. Great having you on the show here today. Yeah, right on. Thanks, Eric. Right on. Today's episode was brought to you by the Construction Conclave. If you as a construction leader would like to develop your skills and get involved in a community of like-minded construction professionals who are focused on building healthy teams, profitable projects, and long-term successful businesses, then the Construction Conclave is for you. It's a private invitation-only group of construction leaders that are focused on developing their leadership skills. We do training every single month online that looks at how to become a better leader in a very practical, straightforward way. We also have other events that build community and camaraderie so that you can associate with others who are interested in developing their skills as leaders. If you'd like more information and to see if you qualify for participating in the Conclave, feel free to reach out to me, eric at eric anderton.com. Thank you for listening to this episode of Construction Genius. Hope you found that 1% of inspiration to help you in the next few days. If you like the show, please give us a five-star review on iTunes, share it with other construction leaders who you think would benefit, and thanks again for listening.